Hello and welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with your hosts Sydney Timmons and Becky Lawrence. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that we will be covering a diverse range of mental health topics that may be distressing to some listeners. You can find a full list of the topics being covered in each episode in the show notes. Please check the show notes before listening to any of our episodes. Welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with me, Sydney Timmins. I am a writer, a podcaster, and have fought many battles with my own mental health and have survived. And I'm here today talking to you, which I think, I guess, is a positive. So this episode is part two to the episode I released last week on dialectical behaviour therapy. So last time I talked about the one-to-one therapy sessions, which involved the behaviour chain analysis and diary cards. I then moved on to the core skill of mindfulness as part of dialectical behaviour therapy. This week, I'm going to be looking at interpersonal effectiveness. I'm also going to be looking at distress tolerance and emotion regulation. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the crisis telephone that is part of the dialectical behaviour therapy treatment package. Last time I didn't put up a full set of show notes purposefully because I thought I would just put them all together in this one. So this week you should find a full set of show notes associated with the last episode and this episode. So let's just jump right in to what is interpersonal effectiveness. Interpersonal effectiveness skills help the individual maintain current relationships and it also helps you to develop new relationships and deal with conflicts that occur in those relationships. So one of the things that people with borderline personality disorder find particularly difficult is the relationships they have with other people. They tend to be very volatile and rocky. And so these skills are a very important part of being able to have a life worth living. And one thing that I was constantly told throughout my treatment with dialectical behaviour therapy is that I didn't have or hadn't learnt the skills needed to be able to have effective relationships to be able to manage my emotions and to be able to deal with the times that I had high emotions. So interpersonal effectiveness allows the individual to gain those skills and to be able to effectively communicate with others about their own needs. For me, I particularly had issues with identifying what those needs were to begin with and then effectively communicating it. I think I have described it to other people that sometimes I have an issue with not having any tact. And so, for example, I would either blurt out something that was completely off the scale for most people to fully appreciate, such as for some reason I decided that when I was 16, I would tell someone that I would find their house and burn it down, as you do. That doesn't really endear myself to other people. So how I made friends back then, I have no idea. So the main aim of this particular module of interpersonal effectiveness, help the individual be skillful in getting what they need and what they want from other people, to help them build relationships and end destructive relationships, and enable them to walk the middle path in maintaining those relationships. In this module, you also learn about the things that get in the way of you being interpersonally effectiveness, such as not having the skills needed and required to be able to maintain those relationships and build new ones, not knowing what you want. So this was the issue for me. I didn't know what I wanted. Also, there are different emotions that get in the way of you being able to express your wants and your needs. So for example, in the last episode, I discussed the issues of fear getting in the way of me being able to tell Becky how I felt and my own opinions at that point. As part of this module, you also learn the skills of Dear Man, Dear Man Give, and Dear Man Fast. And what you'll find is that DBT is piled high with acronyms that you are expected to learn. And the point of Dear Man is that it helps you to identify the situation and provides you with the skills that would be most important and effective to be able to get your needs met. So, Dear Man is actually an acronym for the way that you 
a poetry situation when you are interacting with another person. So the D stands for describe, the E stands for express, the A stands for assert, and the R stands for reinforce. So that's the dear part. And then you have the man part, which is stay mindful, appear confident, and negotiate. So a quick recap of the situation. In January, both myself and Becky found a date that was free in the diary for both of us. And so we put in that time slot a date for us to do one of our podcasts together. However, on that day, things changed. So instead of having the entire day for the podcast, we only had the afternoon. And so I was busy until about one o'clock and I told Becky that I would be free from one. However, she didn't arrive until four o'clock and we had a dinner party that night that I was hosting. So I was cooking. I had guests arriving. Lawrence had decided that we were going to do some carpet cleaning and we offered for Becky to bring her carpet over so that hers could be done. A white rug, which to be honest, we probably shouldn't really have white rugs when we have dogs and bunnies around. She forgot to bring the rug to be cleaned and so Lawrence needed to get the carpet cleaner back to the shop and so because we were waiting for Becky it was getting later and Lawrence decided that when she got here he needed to take the carpet cleaner back because it had to be back by seven and we had guests arriving for this dinner party. So the timings were quite tight and Before myself and Becky got started on doing our podcast, Lawrence took back the carpet cleaner and Becky wasn't necessarily too happy that he hadn't waited for us to do some recording, but I didn't necessarily defend Lawrence in his decision. So using that as an example to give you an idea of what a dear man may comprise of, for describe what you need to do is describe the situation that you are in. You stick to the facts and you tell the other person exactly what you are reacting to. My issue where I couldn't necessarily tell Becky what I was being triggered by, and I mean, we've had these discussions before with Becky where she's gone, I didn't understand what was happening until you told me because people aren't mind readers. What I would need to do is I would need to describe the situation. So what I would start with, Becky you didn't turn up to my house at the time that myself and Lawrence expected. And now you are criticising Lawrence for taking back the carpet cleaner. And those are the facts. So the next part of the dear man is the E part, which is express. And for express, you express your feelings and opinions about the situation that you are currently in, because the other person doesn't necessarily know what you are feeling, because they're not mind readers. So in this situation, I would probably say that listening to you criticise Lawrence actually makes me feel slightly angry at this situation, purely because as a result of everything that's happened today, this is just the way it is. And this is really the only time that Lawrence can return the carpet cleaner without it impacting everything else for this dinner party. The next part of the dear man is the A part, which is to assert. And in this situation, what it is that you do is that you assert what it is that you need in that situation or what you want in that situation. Or even if you want to say no, you say no at this point. And again, don't assume that others know what it is that you want. So continuing with the example with myself and Becky, for me, the assert would probably be I would really appreciate if you didn't criticise Lawrence in this particular choice because at this point he really doesn't have any other option. And the R part of the dear man is to reinforce or reward the person ahead of time by explaining the positive effects that they will experience if my needs are met. So my need is that I would appreciate that Lawrence isn't criticised because it makes me angry And so the alternative is that if she doesn't criticise Lawrence, and I've asked her not to criticise Lawrence, 
I would really appreciate that. That would actually make me feel a lot better about the situation. And there are times, don't get me wrong, when Lawrence's decisions aren't necessarily the best ones. But in this situation, there wasn't really anything else he could do. At this point, when you are reinforcing, you can also point out the negatives if you don't get what you need. But don't use this as a kind of bargaining chip, if that makes sense, so that you can go, well, if you don't do this, I'm just going to get more angry. Isn't really that effective. So that brings us on to the man part of the dear man. And at this point, what you need to do is you need to stay mindful. So you need to stay focused on your goal and employ something called the broken record technique, particularly if you're trying to say no to something. So what you might find is that if someone is trying to get you to do something that you don't necessarily want to do, they may ask you in different ways, slightly changing the words. And what it means by broken record is that you just keep repeating, no, I'm sorry, I don't want to do that. Or no, I'm sorry, that isn't something that I can do for you. Whilst you're staying mindful, you also ignore attacks. So if the person tries to attack you, you can change the subject. You need to ignore any threats that they say towards you. If you don't do this, then I'm going to do X. You need to ignore any comments and attempts that they're making to get you to say yes. Don't respond to the attacks. So if they start to say, well, I'm going to do this, just ignore it. And by ignoring it, which is easier said than done, I have to admit, you can continue with what you are trying to achieve. The A in the man part of this is to appear confident. And again, this is easier said than done, particularly if you are scared of what may happen in the situation that you find yourself in. So you're saying no, and you're scared of what the other person may say or respond to. But what you need to ensure is that whilst you're in this particular dear man process, that you do appear confident with what you're saying. So you use a confident voice, you use confident body language, and you maintain eye contact with the individual, because that means that you are not giving signals to that other person that perhaps you do want to say yes when in fact really in reality you want to say no and then the end part of the man is to negotiate so for example if you are asking for something such as for me I'm asking Becky to please not criticize Lawrence he's doing the best that he can in this situation you need to be willing to negotiate with how that is achieved. So you need to be willing to give a little bit to get what you are asking for. You can offer other solutions if the solution that you have offered isn't going to be effective for the other person. You can also throw that back at the other person. What is it that you think you can do to help with that situation? Particularly if the other person feels that they're not able to meet the needs that you are asking for to be met. So, for example, Becky may have said that she was sorry for the fact that she was criticising Lawrence and she will do her best in the future to not criticise him. However, this isn't necessarily going to be a case where she will do this all the time because there may be times that she forgets. Here's another example of negotiate. So, for example, over Christmas, myself and Lawrence had an argument about the time that he gets home. And all I asked for was for him just to let me know what time he might be getting home. So what time he's leaving the office. And Lawrence is a creature of habit and he would often leave the office at about five and he would often then walk through the door at our home at about 6.30. So I thought it would be appropriate for me to ask him to just let me know when he's leaving the office or what time I should expect him to come home. However, in the negotiation phase, Lawrence said that that wasn't going to happen, and that I should just assume there is no specific time that he'll be coming home, which really doesn't solve the issue. So I then said to Lawrence, that really isn't going to help me achieve what I need from you. And at that point, he said, okay, well then, let's assume that I will be home each night at 6.30 
by the way, I already did this, and that he would do his best to let me know in advance if he wasn't going to be home at the time he usually would be expected. But that because of meetings, that wouldn't necessarily always be the case and that I needed to be aware of that fact. So that is a dear man in a nutshell. But there are also a dear man give and a dear man fast. And those two different options onto the dear man gives you the additional options of what you are trying to achieve. So for example, with a dear man give, it is to help you maintain the relationship that you have with that person. Or for a dear man fast, it is to help you maintain your own self-respect. So in the dear man give, the give stands for be gentle, act interested, validate and use an easy manner. So what we mean by be gentle is that you express no attack. So you don't express your anger towards that person. You don't threaten that person. So you don't describe any painful consequences if they fail to meet your needs. You don't judge the other person. If you loved me, you would do X. And you don't sneer. So eye rolling, smirking, etc. When you act interested, you listen to that other person's point of view. You don't interrupt them. You use body language that shows them that you're listening, such as leaning forward, eye contact, etc. In terms of validate, you validate that individual's feelings as well. So you use both words and actions that show that you understand and empathise with the other person about the situation. Use an easy manner. So at this point, what it is, is really ensuring that you are using a nice gentle voice. You aren't being overly punitive to the other person. You may even decide to use humour. Also smile. Just a small thing as a smile can help the individual feel just better about the situation. So the second one, the dear man fast, is to maintain your own self-respect. So this is what I should have employed with Becky. So the fast stands for be fair, no apologies, stick to values and be truthful. So what I mean by be fair is be fair to yourself and the other person. Validate your own feelings and wishes as well as the other person's. So you could say, for example, with me, I can say, I can see that you're frustrated, Becky. I'm also frustrated. However, this is the best thing in this situation. No apologies is pretty obvious. You don't apologise for your opinion and for you disagreeing with that other person. So, for example, I would disagree with the criticism that Becky was putting onto Lawrence as being unjust. In terms to stick to values, don't sell out what you believe in. So stick with what you see of the situation and go, look, I think you're being a bit too critical in this situation. And also finally, be truthful. Don't lie, don't act helpless and don't exaggerate the situation or make excuses for why you are saying what you are saying. And as with everything in skills, you will be expected to go away with some handouts and try and practice your dear man skills whilst in between sessions. The second part of this module is to help you build relationships and then help you end destructive ones. And so in the DBT skills sessions, what would happen is that you'd spend some time talking about how to find and how to get to know people and how to get them to like you. So for example, ensuring that your proximity to other people is better than before, so you aren't pulling away from people, that you are having some kind of similarity, so that always helps when you are trying to engage with someone else that you don't necessarily know. So for example, you may have a bond over unicorns, In this particular part of the skills training, it would help with conversation skills, also expressing your likes and dislikes, and how to join different groups. In this particular section, it would also have some additional skills on mindfulness, so being mindfulness of others' needs, and how you would then go about building closeness with other people by using mindfulness. And also, it would give you the skills needed to help you to end destructive or interfering relationships by staying in wise mind. So assessing the situation and going, actually, this isn't best for me. How to use the skills to end that relationship. 
and how to stay safe. So for example, it may be a volatile and abusive relationship. How do you get out of that type of relationship? And the last section to interpersonal effectiveness skills is walking the middle path. And so this is balancing acceptance and change. So the sections in walking the middle path are dialectics, validation, recovering from invalidation and strategies for changing behaviour. So what people may find is that those that suffer with borderline personality disorder see the world in black and white. There isn't really any grey and that there is only one way that you can see a particular situation which isn't true. So it's quite difficult when you are looking at dialectics and identifying that there are opposites and it is entirely possible that both of those are true at the same time but there are also things in between those opposites. You also learn skills as to why validation of another person is extremely important, why you need to validate that other person, and also ways to identify that what the other person's perspective is, is also valid. Conversely, there is ways on how to deal with times when you may be invalidated by people, and there are times when that is helpful, particularly when you're trying to understand the nature of dialectics and seeing it from another person's perspective but also how painful invalidation can be and what it means when you are feeling invalidated and the emotions that it can bring up in you and the key to dialectical behavior therapy skills is the fact that you are trying to change your behavior you are trying to change and there are going to be things that get in the way of behavior change it isn't easy There may be issues where people around you push back and you don't get the responses that you expect to get from others around you. But this part of skills is really looking at what can help you in the process of behaviour change. So that's just really a whistle-stop tour of what is involved in interpersonal effectiveness skills of dialectical behaviour therapy. That leads us on to the next module, which is emotion regulation. So in the emotion regulation module, the aim of this module is to reduce the emotional suffering of the individual with borderline personality disorder. And this is done by understanding and being able to name your own emotions, decrease the frequency of unwanted emotions, decrease emotional vulnerability and decrease emotional suffering. The key message in this is that even though emotions can be particularly difficult for people suffering with borderline personality disorder, They're actually important and have a function to play in our daily lives. So I have to admit, I have this relationship with emotions, or at least I did at the time, where I would sit there and go, I don't like emotions, I hate them, they cause me to behave in a way that I'm not happy with, therefore, wouldn't it be better if I didn't feel those emotions? However, that isn't the case. Emotions are important. And as part of dialectical behaviour therapy skills training, you begin to learn what the functions of emotions are and why they are important for you to be able to feel because they are telling you something about the world around you. So this module gives you the skills to be able to regulate your emotions and regulate the emotions that you want, not to regulate the emotions that other people tell you that you should be reducing in the intensity that you're experiencing those emotions. So in terms of the chain analysis, emotion regulation can help you reduce the vulnerabilities that you may be experiencing, which in turn helps you to maintain your emotions and reduce them from becoming painful and also improves your resilience to those emotions. DBT skills help you to reduce the peaks in emotions that someone with borderline personality disorder will feel and it also helps you to recover from extremes and emotions so remember I talked about before that emotions for people with borderline personality disorder tend to be all over the place to begin with but they also have this issue where if you have an extreme emotion you tend to be at the highest part of that emotion for longer than other people would. As with all the modules associated with dialectical behaviour therapy, you still need to use your core mindfulness skills, particularly the non-judgmental stance and observations, and all of those will help you to describe your emotions that you are feeling. So for me, the main emotion that I could feel, or the only emotion really that I could recognise, was anger. But not everything is anger, and sometimes 
it was sadness that was coming out as anger. Also, sometimes shame would come out as anger. And so this module takes you back really to the beginning of understanding what emotions are. And because you can't really start to regulate your emotions until you actually fully understand what it is you are feeling. So this module takes you through eight key emotions of anger, disgust, envy, fear, happiness, jealousy, love, sadness, shame and guilt. And the DBT skill teaches you a model of how to describe those emotions and how to then put a name on that emotion. And it talks you through the prompting events, the vulnerabilities, because there are things that can impact how you deal with your emotions, the biological changes in your body that emotions can cause, such as how the brain changes in the nervous system with the unconscious increase in heart rate and temperature in the body and other body sensations that accompany the emotion and how that links in with how you then express the emotion in terms of body language, words and actions. And so we looked at how a emotion that you were expressing could potentially be a secondary emotion rather than the primary emotion underneath. And so they looked at how we could identify what the primary emotion actually was. I always find that it is more useful to have an example of a situation than it is just to try and figure it out. So here's my example. So you had wanted to go out with your friends, but they've all cancelled on you. So you start to feel your heart rate increase. Your temperature starts to rise. Your muscles begin tightening. Your fists are clenching together and your teeth and your jaw, there's tension there. And this results in you shouting at the people who have let you down. So you feel angry. But underlying that anger is sadness because you blame yourself for your friends cancelling. You're irritable and you're grouchy. And with all of that combined, you see the world in a negative light. So when you feel the emotions, there are two ways of approaching the emotional situation. So you can either decide to use opposite action or problem solving, depending on what it is that is needed. By checking facts, does your emotion match the situation? Are you making assumptions about why everyone has cancelled? Is that really the case, that what you're thinking is true? And whilst you go through that process, you identify that the emotion that you are feeling is not aligning with the facts. You are not to blame for the fact that everyone has cancelled. It may be because everyone has got the flu because it's flu season. Your anger is not fitting and aligning with the situation and your anger isn't effective. The problem here is that being angry with your friends because they are sick isn't going to help anyone in that situation. So you decide to use opposite action skills. You do the opposite to what you're feeling and because you have identified that you feel sad you do something that is opposite to that sadness and you look for something that is happy. So for example, you may decide to watch a film that is a comedy. So if you decide that the facts are the problem, and by the facts I mean the facts of that situation, so for example, is that they have turned up later than you agreed, and so therefore, because they haven't acknowledged that they haven't shown up at the time that they were expected, the facts are the problem. So the fact that that person was late is the issue. So in this situation, what happens is that you use problem solving skills to realise that you would benefit by using a dear man on that person. So you use the dear man skills that we discussed in interpersonal effectiveness to tell them that you are both sad and angry at the same time because that person was late and hasn't apologised and that you would really appreciate an apology. And as a result of approaching the problem with this solution, then it will help you to reduce negative emotions. So those are two examples of when the facts are wrong in the situation or when the feeling is wrong in a situation. Another part of this particular module is to give you strategies that will help you to reduce your vulnerability in everyday life, particularly when you may find that you're stuck in emotion mind. And so here is another acronym. As I said before, DBT is based on acronyms. And this acronym is known as ABC Please. So what do I mean by ABC, please? A stands for accumulate positive emotions. And that in itself is split into two different parts, the short term and the long term. So in terms of short term accumulating of positive emotions, you try to do pleasant things that you can do right now. And in this particular moment, that will give you some positive emotions. The second half, the long term goals, 
are really things that you can change in your everyday habits that will help to maximize the positive events that occur in your life. So for example, if you find that you stay at home most of the time and as a result of feeling lonely and sad, you need to change your lifestyle to try and do the opposite of that. So you make sure that you accept opportunities to do different things when they arise. B stands for building mastery. And so this means that you do things that make you feel successful and competent in your everyday life because this helps you to make you feel less helpless and less hopeless. And in my situation, it makes me feel less useless. The whole idea of the please skills is to ensure that you take care of your mind and body at the same time. As human beings, all of us can identify that we find it more difficult to deal with our emotions at particular times. So for example, if we are sick, if we haven't had enough sleep, and we haven't necessarily had enough to eat. I know that there's quite a few people out there that can get hangry, which is a anger associated with being hungry. And so this is what the plea skills intend to try and address. So the plea skills stand for PL, which is physical illness. So you need to take care of any physical illness. The E is balanced eating. So ensuring that you have a healthy, balanced diet. I know that personally, if I tend to eat rubbish food, then generally I feel rubbish. Avoid mood altering substances is the next one, which is the A. And so this is avoiding those substances such as alcohol and over-the-counter medication and illegal drugs. And finally, E is get exercise. And for someone like me who isn't overly fond of exercise, I do find that when I do some exercise, I do generally feel better for doing so. Once again, during this module, you are expected to do homework and that is practicing the skills that you are being taught. And you would be expected to fill in some worksheets each week. The final module of dialectical behaviour therapy skills is distress tolerance. And in distress tolerance, the idea is to help the client or the individual with borderline personality disorder gain the skills needed and the ability to survive times of crisis without making things worse. So for example, when I would have an overload of emotions, I would tend to use self-harm, alcohol, or over-the-counter medications to numb that pain and allow me to move on with my life. However, these coping skills were not necessarily the most effective. So this module was important because of two main reasons. Number one, the pain and distress is part of everyday life, unfortunately. We can't stop it, but we can change the way that we deal with the situation at the time. So there are times that everyone will feel overwhelmed and so dealing with those in a non-destructive way will improve a person's life. So for example, by dealing with an overload of emotions without cutting is going to be of benefit to the person who is suffering this emotional overload. And refusing to accept the fact that there are going to be times when all of us feel emotions and that those will be difficult is going to cause additional suffering because you're going to constantly feel like you're a failure. And two, developing distress tolerance techniques is important because it will help you to change your behaviour because the pain and suffering can hinder your ability to change behaviour generally. And so this module is really split into two main strategies for the person undergoing dialectical behaviour therapy skills and that is crisis survival skills and reality acceptance skills or the ability to radically accept a situation. So I'm going to first start by talking about crisis survival skills. So you are taught the stop skills, the pros and cons of behaviours, tip your body chemistry, and distract with wise mind accept skills, self-soothe with the five senses, and improve the moment that you are in. So all of those are what would be termed as the crisis survival skills. So STOP is another acronym. And so S stands for stop, don't just react, stay in control regardless of what your emotions are trying to get you to do on impulse. T, take a step back, take a break if you need to, take a deep breath and think about your next step, hold back the impulsivity. O, observe and notice what is happening inside and outside of your body, observe what is happening in the situation you're in. 
and P. Proceed mindfully. Take charge and decide what you plan to do next and act with awareness, not just on autopilot, where you can get carried away with your emotions. And that's when we experience issues with impulsivity. What is going to make the situation better and what is going to make the situation worse? So you employ the stop skills when you start to feel that your emotions are getting the better of you. Pros and cons is really a way to assess a situation where a decision has to be made. So you either choose one thing or another thing. And so what you do is you start by looking at what are the pros and cons of that situation, particularly if you act on your urges that are being primarily governed by your emotions. And what will happen if you don't act on that urge? The tip skills are there for changing your body chemistry. And this is a new skill that wasn't in the original one that I did. But what the tip skills stands for, again, it's an acronym. T stands for tip the temperature of your face with cold water because this helps you to calm down fast. And the T comes from the tip and the temperature. I stands for intense exercise. So the I is the intense part because this can help calm the body when it is revved up by emotion. So I don't know about you, if you get angry, I used to have in my office a small punching bag. And so I would hit the punching bag when I felt frustrated. And P actually has two different meanings. We have paced breathing, which is breathing deep in the belly, slowing down the breath, breathing out longer than you would when you breathe in. And the second one is paired muscle relaxation. So whilst breathing into your belly, tense your body muscles, notice the tension in your body, and while breathing out, say the word in your mind, relax, and let go of that tension. And you'll be able to feel the physical difference in your body. There are also distracting skills, which are part of your crisis survival skills. And this is the wise mind accepts. And again, it's another acronym. So accepts is the acronym and it stands for A, activities. So watching TV, doing a jigsaw, listening to music, doing exercise, playing sports, going out, playing cards, doing a crossword puzzle, doing a word search. Anything that is an activity that causes you to be distracted from your emotions. C is contributing, so you can volunteer, you can help friends or family, you can surprise someone, give things away to charity, you can call someone. The next C is comparisons, so you can compare your feelings now to another time when you felt different, or you can think of those that are coping the same as you or less than you, and you can compare yourself to those that are less fortunate to yourself. I have to admit that I found this one probably the most difficult because it would give me a reason, particularly when I thought about people that were worse off than me, as a way to tell myself off that I wasn't good enough, because there are people out there worse off than myself. The next letter is E, and that stands for different emotions. So for example, you can read emotional books or TV shows, you can listen to emotional music. The next letter is P, which is pushing away, so you can push the situation away for a period of time. You can mentally leave the situation. If you notice yourself ruminating, you can go, hang on a minute, no. T stands for other thoughts, such as counting to 10, counting colours in a painting or in a poster, or even in the room that you're sat in, or even outside. Again, watching TV or reading a book. And S is other sensations. So that includes squeezing a ball, listening to really loud music, having a hot or cold shower, holding ice in your hands, anything that changes the sensation in your body. The final crisis survival skills are the self-soothe skills. And so that is self-soothe using the five senses. So that's taste, touch, hearing, smell, vision. And then I just had to use my fingers to make sure I had all five. So taste, eat your favourite food, eat some chocolate, drink some coffee, drink a hot tea, eat your favourite childhood food, add some spice to your dinner. All of those are taste touch, have a hot bath or a shower, pet your dogs or cats, so for me it's my dogs, have a massage. I used to have a, or I still have it, a purple fluffy pillow that I had at work that I would sit there and either hug or stroke when I was feeling emotional. I also have a heart-shaped worry stone, which is very smooth and cold to the touch that I use to help with the sensation of touch. Hearing, so you can listen to loud music, You can listen to an open fire and nature sounds. So I actually have a whole host of different nature sounds on iTunes. 
You can also sing to your favourite songs. In terms of smell, you can light some nice smelling candles. You could use bath bombs or you could use bubble baths. You can spritz aftershave around or perfume. You can go brew some coffee. I don't know about you, but I love the smell of a new book or an old book, depending. And in terms of vision, you can look at something that is beautiful, such as a flower or something that you find really interesting. You can go to a scenic spot and observe. You can watch a sunrise or a sunset. And you can watch your dogs playing. That's one of my favourite pastimes, is watching my dogs really beat each other up. So that is the end of the crisis survival skills and leads us on to reality acceptance. Reality acceptance is split into several different areas, which include radical acceptance, turning the mind, willingness, half smile and willing hands and allowing the mind, which is being mindful of your current thoughts. So for everyone, there are certain things that we just cannot change and we have to accept them the way that they are. So, for example, things that we've done in the past, we can't go back and change the past. And if we continue to think about it and ruminate on it, that can cause us pain, particularly if we keep going over it again and then telling ourselves off because of the situation that we were in. So we have to radically accept the situation. And so radically accepting a situation means that we have to accept a situation all the way. We can't just accept part of the situation. We have to accept everything as it is. So you need to accept it in your heart, you need to accept it in your mind and you need to accept it in your body. And so once you've accepted that that is reality, you need to then stop fighting against it, particularly if the reality that you wanted it to be is not the case, because it's just going to keep causing you pain. So an example for me was when I was diagnosed with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. During that time, I was going through DBT and radical acceptance was a key way to help me deal with my own diagnosis and discomfort associated with that diagnosis. So I have relapsing remitting MS, and what does that really mean for me? It really means that there are going to be a lot of uncertainties in my life, because no one can actually tell me how this disease will progress, because everyone is an individual. So there are certain things in my life that I'm going to need to change, particularly in terms of my energy levels. I get tired quicker than before. And if I wasn't going to radically accept the fact that I had this condition, I would probably continue to push myself. And I have to admit, I still do push myself. And I get to the point where I'm so exhausted that I end up in bed for a few days. And if I'd paced myself and gone, hang on a minute, you know that doing lots of things causes you to have fatigue, why not pace yourself and ensure that you will be able to continue doing things for longer? I also needed to radically accept that because of my diagnosis, I probably wouldn't be given permanent residency when I was out in Australia because I was diagnosed out in Australia. And that's pretty much because of the fact that I would cost their health system a lot of money. And I would really in some ways be a drain to their health system and I think that's probably fair enough and people around me in Australia said why not try and see what happens but would that just be prolonging my suffering with the hope that they might say yes you can stay. Also the fact that the diagnosis itself when I arrived back in the UK there was a period of time where I was in several different locations so when I got back to the first place and the first NHS trust, I was made to go through a whole heap of tests again to show that I had MS. And every time I would hope and pray that they got it wrong in Australia, that perhaps it wasn't MS, perhaps it was something else. Each time I would get the letter back from the hospital after having the MRI, and it would say that the MRI was consistent with someone with relapsing remitting MS, It would be almost like I was having to come to terms with the diagnosis all over again. And so all I was really doing was prolonging my pain. I would just constantly be hoping for a different result and it never happened. So I need to radically accept the situation that I'm in. So there are several things that need to be radically accepted by everyone. One is that reality is as it is, the facts of the past and the present are what they are regardless of whether you like it or not. 
So regardless of whether I like it, I am a person who is suffering with multiple sclerosis. There are always limitations in the future, not only for yourself, but for others around you. There is often generally a cause to every situation that can cause you pain and suffering. And life can be worth living, even with the painful events that occur in it. There are several reasons why accepting reality can prove beneficial, particularly for people going through dialectical behaviour therapy. So in my case, rejecting what was happening with my health wouldn't have changed the fact that I was suffering with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. The way for me to deal with the situation was for me to accept it and to then identify what it was that I needed to continue a life that was similar to what I was doing before. I had to accept that pain can't be avoided because it's telling us something important. And in my instance, that was the reason why I was diagnosed in the first place, because there was changes in the body sensations that I was feeling. Rejecting the fact that I had MS would just cause me more suffering. And don't get me wrong, it isn't easy to do. I have to constantly keep reminding myself that I am not necessarily as fit and healthy as I used to be. But refusing to acknowledge the situation would just keep me stuck, would also keep me angry, bitter and feeling shame and guilt about the situation because it's my fault that I am back in the UK. And although the acceptance of the situation has led me to feel sad, as a result of that, calmness often follows because you have fully accepted the situation that you're in. And so as part of radical acceptance, you're also taught about this concept of called turning the mind. And so that is constantly bringing yourself back to the acceptance where there is going to be less suffering. Another part of reality acceptance is being willing to accept the reality. So you need to have this positive attitude and the right attitude and approach to life to allow you to continue with your life. So for example, going back to my example with MS... I had two different options. I could fight against the diagnosis or I could just say, this is it. This is what I have. I just need to get on with it. So in the first option, if I had fought against it and I had decided that there was nothing wrong with me, that it was all fine, I would continue to push myself. And then when things started to go wrong, so for example, when I wasn't able to do certain activities, I would then end up feeling extremely depressed and I may end up retiring to my bed, hiding under the duvet and refusing to continue with my life, which is me being completely willful. And the second option was to just accept it for what it was, allow myself some leeway and to be compassionate towards myself. It would then allow me to go, well, this is the situation I'm in. I need to take medication. I would then be able to better face the world and not be feeling in as much pain as I was before. Half smile and willing hands are both techniques that are also used to accept reality, but this time it's to accept reality with your body, so that is entirely accepting reality. Half smile is where you relax your face, neck and shoulders, and slightly raise the corners of your mouth, and adopt a relaxed facial expression as a way to accept reality. So our emotions can be partially controlled by our facial expressions and so you can give people some sense of control over their emotion and what they're feeling with doing something as simple as half smiling. And willing hands again is something similar in terms of the half smile. It's sending different signals to the brain about how you're feeling in that situation. So for example if you clench your fists you're sending a message to the brain that you're angry However, if you do the opposite and you relax your hands, your arms, your shoulders, then you're sending the message to your brain that actually you aren't feeling angry, you're feeling the opposite of angry, you're feeling relaxed and calm. A new section that has been added to the distress tolerance module is dealing with addiction. And so this is something that I didn't go through in the skills training sessions. However, I have since learned it whilst doing schema therapy. And again, it is another acronym. And this one is DCBA. And so what they are looking for is D, which is dialectical abstinence. C, clear mind and community reinforcement. B, burning bridges and building new ones. And A, alternate rebellion and adaptive denial. 
So dialectical abstinence means it's the blending together of the complete abstinence and also harm reduction. And so this is kind of bringing together two different extremes. One of those is that you stop doing the destructive behaviour right away. So from right now, you stop self-harming, you stop drinking, you stop doing the harmful behaviour. However, it's also acknowledging the fact that there may be times when you do end up slipping up. But the aim is to minimise the damage that you're doing at the time of doing the activity. So for example, for me, I got myself all worked up. I couldn't find the skills that were helping me to soothe myself. So I decided that I would drink some whiskey. And the reason why I chose whiskey was because I wanted to numb the pain that I was feeling. So that's the emotional pain. But before I would have chosen alcohol that I liked, I chose something that I didn't like, which is whiskey. And I chose the cheapest, nastiest whiskey in the cupboard because I didn't want to encourage myself to repeat the behaviour later on. So whilst I was doing the harmful behaviour, I was reducing that harm and reducing the possibility that I would go and do the same harmful behaviour later on. So clear mind and community reinforcement. Clear mind is similar to wise mind, but it comprises of addict mind, clean mind, and then combining the two together to create something called clear mind. So what we're doing here is we're combining the memory of addict mind and the fact that you are clean at this point, but you have the knowledge that there may be a chance of relapse, but that relapse is not inevitable. What it means by community reinforcement is being in certain situations will make it more difficult for you to be able to make the most effective decisions. So for example, if you continue to be friends with your drug dealer, that is not necessarily going to make you find it easy to abstain from drug taking. Also, if you tend to go to bars to socialise and you have an issue with alcohol, that's not necessarily going to be conducive to you to abstaining from alcohol. But the whole point of this is to find ways to compromise. Your friends may find that they only tend to socialise at the pub What strategies can you employ to ensure that you don't fall back into old habits? One way to do this is to ensure that your current lifestyle is actually more rewarding than your past addictive behaviours. So what you might find is that you remember all those horrific hangovers that you would get after a night out with your friends and the fact that you wouldn't be able to do anything the next day. Maybe if you go to the pub, you ensure that the next day you have some kind of activity planned and so that you can go and do that and enjoy that and think to yourself if I was hungover I would not be doing this and I would not be enjoying it. So B stands for burning bridges and building new ones. So in terms of burning bridges it is looking at you accepting that you're not going to engage with the addictive behaviour again. So this could mean getting rid of the things that will help you fall back into that addictive behaviour. So for example, if you tell everyone that you're quitting something, then you're more likely to do it. If you, for example, self-harm like I did, if you throw away all of your kitchen knives that you associate with self-harm, then you are more likely to stop doing it. Building bridges also helps you to deal with the cravings associated with changing your behaviour. And so by creating a different visual image or smell, for a situation when you have a craving it can help you stop and manage that craving because you're thinking of the opposite thing so for example in the skills book it states that if you have a craving for cigarettes you can have an image of being on a beach so the smell of the sea air and the salt and the image of the sea in front of you can help you to manage the cravings that you are experiencing alternative rebellion is that if the addictive behaviour is as a result of you pushing back against what is expected of you, or even as a way to combat boredom, then you can try things that are a source of rebellion, but that is not so destructive. So for example, you could shave your head, you could wear unmatched shoes, you could dye your hair a wild colour. So for me, I went purple and I think I went blue and black for a while. You could even, instead of self-harming, you could go out and get yourself a tattoo. So for me, I actually have two. 
And both of them are based on the semicolon tattoo, which shows that I am suffering with mental health, but my story isn't over yet. And the second part of the A is adaptive denial. And so this is when you cannot get rid of the urge or the craving that you're having of an addictive behaviour. You can try and change that behaviour for another behaviour. So for example, if you have an urge to have alcohol, you can change that to have an urge for something sweet or savoury. If you have urges such as I do to binge eat, you can sit there and go, I'm not going to eat in the next five minutes and just take it five minutes at a time. The next five minutes you say to yourself, I'm not going to eat for another five minutes and continue to do that until you get up to maybe a time of 30 minutes. And it means that you can then cope with the craving better because you only have to cope for five minutes. And like the other modules, you are expected to do homework and you are generally given homework sheets to practice these different skills that you are being taught. So when I did DBT skills, we had a set format. So the first half of the session was to review everyone's homework. So each person had the opportunity to discuss their homework. There would then be a break. We would then return and have a mindfulness practice. And then we would go on to the different teaching modules that we were taking at that time. So that could be the mindfulness, the distress tolerance, emotion regulation, or interpersonal effectiveness skills modules. As part of the DBT skills, there was also the DBT crisis phone. And so what this meant was that whilst using the crisis telephone, you could use that to get additional help and support and coaching when you were developing your ability to use the different skills. So for example, it would mean that you would be able to speak to a therapist between your therapy sessions when you needed help the most. So there were certain situations that you could ring the phone for. So when you needed help to deal with an immediate crisis, such as feeling suicidal or having an urge to self-harm. And also when you're trying to use new DBT skills but you need some help and advice on how to do them effectively. For the phone that I had access to, it was only up until a certain time at night. So at 10pm, the phone would stop being answered and it would only be for a short period of time. It wasn't something that you could phone up and have a good gossip over. It was literally just, I'm in crisis. Here's some skills to help you. Let's see if we can calm you down. I found the phone extremely useful, particularly when I was struggling with using my skills. And I believe that one of the things that therapists criticise about those with borderline personality disorder is the fact that we tend to be quite needy. And the crisis phone allowed you to be able to constructively use your therapist's time while still feeling that there was someone there to help you if you needed it. So that's really what DBT skills and DBT therapy is like for someone with borderline personality disorder. That was really a whistle-stop tour. I couldn't go into each aspect in as much depth as you get when you're doing the skills training. However, I think that gives you a good overview of what dialectical behaviour therapy is all about. In terms of how effective DBT is, it is one of the most highly researched therapies for the treatment of borderline personality disorder and it has been identified as the gold standard. What is important to know is that previously to the dialectical behaviour therapy, clinicians thought that borderline personality disorder was untreatable. However, evidence now shows that as a result of DBT, there is a decrease in deliberate self-harm and reported quality of life measures have increased. As I said previously, I don't think I would be here if I hadn't gone through DBT myself. DBT has been researched now in the treatment of other mental health conditions such as post-traumatic stress, eating disorders, substance dependence and depression. And that treatment now allows people to have a life worth living. Next week, the episode will be the book review of My Courage to Tell by Laura E. Corbeth and it will be a discussion between myself and Becky. I am hopefully recording this week my discussion with 
The Secret Psychiatrist. So hopefully that will be out soon once I edit it. And I really hope you enjoyed this discussion on dialectical behaviour therapy. If you have any questions or comments, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. And we will speak to you again next week. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. If you need additional help with your mental health, please contact the Samaritans on 116-123, which is a 24-hour helpline. And if you need additional information about mental health issues, please visit MIND at mind.org.uk. Our next book will be My Courage to Tell by Laura E. Corbeth. If you'd like to find out more about the MHBC podcast, please visit our website, mentalhealthbookclub.com. We really hope that you enjoy this podcast and we would like to hear what you think. Please head over to Twitter, follow us at MHBC underscore podcast, or head over to Facebook and follow our Facebook page, which is Mental Health Book Club. If you would like to show your support further, please share us with your family and friends and leave us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. We are now on Patreon. Please head over to patreon.com forward slash MHBC to donate as little as $2 a month to the Mental Health Book Club podcast. As a result of your donation, you will get early access to some of our episodes. You will get specific episodes that are only for patrons. You'll be eligible to be entered into free prize draws.